welcome back to Murderlicious. I'm Lindsay. And I'm Lauren. And today's story takes place in the 1990s in New York City. And this case has a little bit of everything. It's got drugs. It's got nightlife. It's got murder. It's got a little bit of everything. And just a disclaimer, this case has been romanticized a lot in the media. Giving this case so much fame and attention takes away from the tragedy that it really is. Hollywood movies made it into a fantasy, and families have suffered. A lot of the sources of the story come from the point of view of one of the murderers, Michael Alleg, when the real victim here is Angel Melendez. It's disheartening that there is not a lot more information about Angel. We originally were going to do the episode centered around him, but there's just not enough information out there to do it justice. So we are also going to be talking a lot about the murderers, mostly Michael, but there are two. It's also disgusting that when you Google Angel Melendez, you see drug dealer first before you see murder victim. And the media depictions revolve around Michael and his life instead of focusing on the real victim here, who is Angel. And now that that's out of the way, let's get started with the club kids. So although our story takes place in the 90s, I kind of have to give you a little bit of background about the late 80s before that. So in the 80s, New York City was filled with wealth, greed, activism, but great nightlife. The club scene was dominated with celebrities. Um, There were a lot of people there who called themselves celebutants. There were drugs, lots of drugs, lots of sex, AIDS. Yeah, so AIDS started in the early 80s, and in 1987, there was an activist group called ACT UP, and they staged a ton of protests, and they were calling attention to the way that the Reagan administration was ignoring the AIDS crisis, and sex was a terrifying idea, and since the clubs were so valuable for that, they kind of became valuable now for more networking and self-advancement and media attention. So in the same year, 1987, Andy Warhol died, and he was like the epitome of New York nightlife. He really left a creative hole that led everybody to take time off from city nightlife, but eventually people regrouped and they made way for the club kids who picked up where the celebutants left off. 80s nightlife transformed to 90s nightlife, and the 80s ethic lived on. There was a lot of press, publicity, money corporation, all these themes that were very 1980s America. But there was also a lot more creative expression and visual arts performances, a lot of extravagance, and there was a really renewed appreciation for a mixed group of people, like celebrating everybody and their uniqueness. So the club kids were a really influential and idolized group. They were super eccentric. They dressed up in elaborate costumes, like glamour beyond belief. Like, think Rocky Horror Picture Show costumes. Like, you would wear it to the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but to regular clubs. There was a lot of drug use to match, you know, the euphoria of the nightlife scene. They wanted to feel as good as they looked. They would party all night. They went on famous talk shows. And there was one quote that said, they created a movement that would forever influence the face of fashion, art, and popular culture. Yeah, they were on Joan Rivers' show, Geraldo. Yeah. Like, big shows, so they were really well-known in New York City and, I guess, all over. The Limelight became one of the most infamous clubs in New York City, and it attracted people from all over the world. Performers such as Marilyn Manson, Cyndi Lauper, and Grace Jones all performed there. And Tunnel, rather than the other night called Tunnel, that was really popular too. Yeah, the Tunnel. Yeah, but our story kind of takes place more around the Limelight. The original club kid, the main player, his name is Michael Alleg. And he grew up in the Midwest, in Indiana, I think, right? Yeah, from South Bend, Indiana. And he always wanted to make a name for himself ever since he was a little boy. Michael was very entrepreneurial. When he was little, he would buy five candy bars for $1 and then sell them for a dollar each. So Michael was the candy man. He had a reputation in school for being bizarre. He was gay, and his parents didn't find out until he was in college. So after... High school, Michael moved to New York to attend Fordham University. There he met his first boyfriend, Kiyoki, who was a superstar DJ, and Michael quit college to become a party promoter. He loved New York City nightlife and worked his way up to become the leader of the club kids. It was fabulous. People would dress up, they would experience the nightlife in the city like a celebrity, and they would get free admission to the clubs for being a part of it. 
During his club promoting, Michael met James St. James, who was his friend and mentor, but kind of also his rival because he was also a club promoter too. And in the shockumentary, James said that everyone was horrified of the little monster, Michael, who came out of nowhere and took away the night scene from the 80s celebutants. They say that everyone was like horrified of him, but also everybody loved him. And they thought it was amazing what he was doing for New York City nightlife and like bringing it back. Michael was reckless, bratty, and fun. Bitchy. He was also bitchy. (laughs) The LGBT kids found a home where they could work within the scene and bond with each other. The big break happened when Andy Warhol died. That was the death of the New York City nightlife, like Lauren said. There was a need to create nightclub celebrities again, and Michael wanted to reinvigorate the New York clubs and inspire others, and he did. He became successful super fast. Everyone loved him and idolized him because he was bringing nightlife back, and by the 90s, he basically was the new Warhol of the New York City nightlife. He became the leader of the club kids. Some of the members of the club kids included James St. James, Jenny Talia, Amanda Lepper, Wallpaper, The It Twins, Richie Rich, Kiyoki, Sophia Lamar, RuPaul, Gitsy, and Angel. They became like local celebrities and national sensations. They were known for their influence on queer culture, and they created a space where LGBTQ youth could experience freedom in the 80s, like amidst the AIDS crisis and all of this um, stigma surrounding them. They were like the gay Paris Hiltons. They were pushing the boundaries of gender, politics, and societal culture. They were amazing. Everyone was so fascinated with them. And I think also that a lot of these kids grew up kind of like Michael did, where they were trying to hide their real identity, but in New York City, they could be exactly who they were, and everybody loved them for it, and they could celebrate their differences instead of being ashamed of them right that was the whole idea of the club kids is to just dress as crazy as possible put on the wildest thing that you can think of and make it fashion and make it known how different you are so michael ruled new york city nightlife for years he was creating his own world basically he was the leader of the club kids and like we said they were super creative with their looks they had their faces covered in makeup their outfits were all diy like from their imagination just anything that they could find they put on their costumes were loud and their personalities were loud michael started to throw illegal parties and surprise locations all around the city but it was always near a club because he knew that the cops would come to bust him so he wanted the club that he was promoting to have thousands of people like two blocks away always going back into the clubs. He was really good at his job and he was really smart. He threw one in a donut shop. He threw one in McDonald's in Times Square. Some of his most famous parties were in the subways, like in New York City. He even did one in a building that had recently exploded. So there was like yellow police tape all over. And like I said, the highlight of the parties were always the police. There's a quote that says that these parties perfectly demonstrated juvenile hilarity, illicit bravery, and the ability to claim total possession of any place that they occupied. So Michael eventually found a mentor in Peter Gation, and he was the king of New York clubs. He owned many of the popular clubs around New York City, and one of the most popular was the Limelight, which was an old church. So Michael threw parties for Peter. He became his promoter, and he eventually ran his entire New York City nightlife portfolio. Michael eventually sold Peter on his idea for a weekly Limelight theme party, and Michael learned really quickly that sex sells. And drugs. Right. So these parties were beautiful and weird. They were glamorous, expressive, freaky. He was the king of downtown. And I think one of the perfect quotes to kind of summarize their message and the parties is one that James St. James said in the shockumentary. And he said, if you got a hunchback, throw a little glitter on it, honey, and dance and show the world that it's okay. The way that they expressed themselves was childish and silly, but it was also very obscene so they had everything from oxygen masks to robot heads to fake blood all over so what they were really doing was they were embracing american capitalism but they were also mocking it they would make fun of the conventions of the consumer society but yet they were kind of desperate to be a part of it and make names for themselves they would pretend to be on drugs like they were caricatures of drug addicted celebrities Like I said, they were just mocking every part of basic American culture, but 
they were also trying to be a part of it. So initially, the club kids were addicted to the fame in the media, but eventually they did become addicted to drugs. So Michael had a really dark side to him. Like, he had nerve, he could shake things up, and eventually he got out of control because there were such big parties, and these people were celebrating him, but they were also enabling him. So Lauren just did a really good job of setting the scene for you of what it was like at this time and Michael's cocky attitude of being this big club promoter for the owner, Peter Gation. One of the people that worked at Peter's clubs was named Andre Angel Melendez, and he was a drug dealer, and he was responsible for bringing the drugs to Peter's clubs. Angel was born in Columbia on May 1st, 1971. He moved from Columbia to New York in 1979 or 1980 when he was eight years old. Michael introduced Angel into the world of the club kids. He was frequently seen in his signature feathered angel wings. Michael said that Angel saw the club kids and wanted to be like them without actually knowing what it was like. And Angel even appeared on the Geraldo show as well. So Angel was officially part of the club kids, but our story kind of still goes back to Michael, and now we're going to talk a little bit about his downfall. One of the parties that Michael threw kind of became, it was described as a circus of the grotesque. There were hammers, blood, brains. It was very cannibalistic, and it was inspired by the movie Blood Feast. This is a movie that Michael saw when he was younger, that he loved. There was a ton of gore, and they took things from the movie like cut off legs and a lot of death and blood those kind of things, and they put them in their parties. Michael's behavior became increasingly gross, really disturbing. He had hepatitis, and he would drink out of other people's drinks and kiss them, and he would turn, like, really gross things into a joke. But all of his friends say that he was so charming that people loved it, and they were like, oh, that's just Michael. They thought that the bad behavior was really refreshing because instead of trying to impress people, and be polite. He wanted to be everybody's worst nightmare. And people loved it and encouraged him to keep going. Right. Like people were enabling him. So Michael eventually forgot that this was all an act and he just became a bad guy. So he went down with the lack of boundaries, too many drugs. He started taking Ropinol and Xanax. His favorite drug was ketamine. Which is an animal tranquilizer. And the club kids, they were just searching for this feeling from drugs that they kind of portrayed in their world. So Michael eventually moved from ketamine to heroin. Walt Paper, who was a club kid and Michael's assistant, he said that they wanted to test the extreme always. Like every single week, how bloody can we get? How scary can we get? How far can this fantasy go? But also how beautiful can it be? How many people can we inspire? Eventually, Michael, every single day, was on coke, heroin, ropinol, ketamine, and then he said the occasional crack and ecstasy. To feed his habit, he cultivated drug dealers like Freeze and Angel, and he also became closer to Peter Gation. Right, Freeze and Angel were his friends that were drug dealers, and Freeze does get more involved in the story in a little bit. So the parties became wilder and wilder every week, and eventually there was just an unimaginable amount of drugs in these clubs. People said that the Peter Gation parties had more coke than they had ever seen in their lives, and drugs became the driving force of the club scene. Jenny Talia, one of the club kids, she said that when you're a part of that scene, you don't even realize that drugs are illegal. Your judgment is blurred, and reality doesn't even exist, and you get to a point where you would rather have drugs than a drink ticket. So given all this blatant and obvious drug use and partying, this didn't last very long. In September of 1995, federal agents raided and padlocked Club Limelight. They were investigating Peter Gation for allowing drugs to be sold there, and I think also for tax evasion. And since Angel worked at the Limelight and dealt drugs there, after the raid, he was fired and had nowhere to live, so he moved in with Michael and Michael's roommate, Freeze. Freeze was the other drug dealer that he befriended, but his real name was Robert Riggs, but they called him Freeze. So Michael and Robert lived together in an apartment, and after the limelight was shut down by the police, Angel moved in with them. And on March 17, 1996, Angel disappeared. He was 24 years old. One of his friends, Walt Paper, went to Michael's apartment to get drugs from Angel, but Angel wasn't there. And he said that Michael somehow had access to all of Angel's drugs, 
and there was a really strange air in the apartment. Walt Paper said that there was a huge cut on the back of Michael's neck, like somebody had stabbed him, and that Michael had dyed his hair from blonde to red, so he had red hair dye on his hands. Or maybe it was blood. So since Angel was missing, not only did his friend Walt Paper notice, but Angel's brother Johnny noticed too, and he started to look for him. He realized that the last time he talked to him was in February, so like a month prior. So Johnny went to the police to file a missing persons report for Angel, but the police wouldn't take the report. So Johnny made flyers with a $4,000 reward and posted them all around the city and started asking everyone if they had seen his brother. Soon rumors began circulating that Michael and Freeze had something to do with Angel's disappearance. So people started to suspect that Michael might have murdered him, and Johnny confronted Michael, and he said that Michael wouldn't even look him in the eyes because he looked so much like Angel. Michael publicly denied it three months prior before his arrest. He was in an interview, and he said, I'm an easy target because I was with him the day before he was gone, but in private, he would confide in others. Around 5 o'clock one morning... Michael's mom woke up to a phone call from him, and she said that he was making no sense. He was talking, but he was blabbering, and he kept saying he committed a murder, and it was Angel, and they didn't know what to do. And Gitsy, one of the club kids and Michael's really good friend, she wrote a diary entry about what Michael told her about Angel's disappearance. She read it in an interview, so I'll read a little bit of it right now, but this is what it said. He did something a week ago I would never in a million years think he could do. He did away with Angel. I hope to God nobody reads this diary. I don't know exactly what happened, but I know it involved a hammer, money, and drugs. He cut off the legs and threw them away in the garbage, and then he put the rest of the body in a box. That box sat in the living room for approximately a week. I actually sat next to it, not knowing, and recently him and Freeze threw the box into the river. That is crazy and sick, and I still love him. And Gitsy said that this secret was the hardest thing in the world and she wishes that she just got Michael sober and then took care of it because Michael was still on all these drugs. And it turns out that that story is exactly what happened. It's actually true. And Michael later told people in an interview, like after he was released from prison, and we'll get into that later, but he said that the reason why he was telling people is because he kind of wanted, once he told somebody else, it's kind of like sharing the burden of his secret. Yeah, he didn't want to be the only one responsible. Right, like sharing the responsibility almost. So after Angel disappeared, Gitsy and Michael fled New York, and they drove to Denver, Colorado. It took them five weeks to get there. Michael thought that he could get there with five bags of heroin, which he said later was foolish of him. So by the time they got to Indiana, he was really sick, so they stopped in his hometown. His mom hadn't seen him in three and a half years, and she went to his hotel. She said that he was in a lot of pain, he didn't want to be touched, and he said that he needed to get heroin right away or methadone. So they did take him in an ambulance to a methadone clinic, and he stayed in town for seven days and left. Gitsy and Michael also wanted to visit their friends Scream and Rachel, and Michael said that this ended up being a big mistake because Rachel ended up writing a song called Give Me My Freedom, And it's also called Murder in Clubland. And there's a backwards loop in the song that says Michael Wears Angel. Rachel said that she loved Michael, but she was also friends with Angel. So she was really conflicted. So Michael got sick again by the time they reached Denver. He just never got enough drugs. And one night, him and Gitsy broke into a vet clinic because they wanted ketamine. But they ended up leaving and they didn't even get the drugs because they got to this freezer and they were like oh all the drugs must be kept in here and they opened it and there was just dead animals in it so they left but michael missed new york and he went back and ended up living with his friend brooke at the chelsea he had no money the press was out of control like him being back in new york was front page news in the city and it was kind of like did he do it did he not do it who cares it makes good press let's invite him to dinner next week So this just shows like how influential he was in the city that people didn't even care how bad of a person he was. And and in this time, nobody called the police. So Michael did attempt to make a comeback. And the newspaper headline when Limelight was shut down was cops label Limelight a honey trap. Like they suck kids in and then you get stuck in there and feed them drugs. So Michael named his party the Honey Trap, and he handed out little jars of honey on the street that said Michael Alex's Honey Trap Grand Opening. He was always working on the party, and he finally had a purpose again, but it 
failed, and he left New York and moved to New Jersey with his new boyfriend, Brian. They were living in a motel. In March of 1996, a group of kids playing at the beach in Miller Field discovered a box that contained a human torso. A tropical storm had helped propel the floating cork line box to Staten Island. So coincidentally, on September 8th of 1996, another dismembered body was fished out of the Harlem River at a pier near 134th Street by a homeless woman. And a police officer in Staten Island caught the Melendez media coverage and initiated an investigation of the John Doe at Miller Field. They used dental records to identify the body. The coroner originally misidentified him as an Asian male. And November 2nd, 1996, finally, is when they identified the body as Angel and rumors of how he was killed were confirmed. On Sunday, March 17th, 1996, Andre Angel Melendez was killed by Michael Alleg and Freeze. And this is the statement that Robert Riggs, Freeze, gave the police. So he said that he heard Michael and Angel loudly arguing in the apartment. He heard a little crash, like glass breaking, and the argument was progressing. It was getting louder. He opened the door and started towards the bedroom. He stopped outside of the bedroom, at which point Michael was yelling, help me, get him off of me. He said that Angel briefly turned and said, stay out, and grabbed Michael by the shoulder or the neck, and he started shaking him violently and banging him against the wall. He was yelling, you better get me my money or I'll break your neck, or something to that effect. And Michael looked at Freeze with a pleading look in his eyes. So freeze robert he grabbed a hammer which was in the closet directly to his left and he hit angel over the head trying to get him off michael and maybe knock him unconscious he said he was in a panic and he was very concerned at angel's level of anger and after the first blow angel turned and grabbed for the hammer freeze said that he might have gotten his hands on it he's not sure but he snatched it back and hit angel again and angel started to go down but was still really pissed off and started going for michael again so freeze hit him a third time and he finally went down. Freeze said that Michael got onto Angel's chest and was strangling him with his hands and Freeze yelled what are you doing and Michael seemed to be very angry at this point. He was cursing at Angel and Michael took a pillow and put it over Angel's face. Freeze said that he tried to push him off of Angel and then he walked into the living room and maybe the bedroom and when he came back Michael was beside the body again and Freeze noticed a broken syringe on the floor by the body. And Michael was pouring something from the bathroom, like cleaner or chemical, into Angel's mouth. Freeze said that he started screaming again, what are you doing? What's your problem? He's He's out. out. And apparently Michael started wrapping tape around his mouth and asked Freeze for the duct tape from the closet and said, you have to help me. So Freeze did help him and he helped him finish wrapping the tape around Angel's mouth and he left. And when he came back, Angel was undressed down to his underwear. And Michael said, help me put him into the bathtub and close the door. And they left him in there for about five to seven days. While Michael and him decided what to do with him. Yeah. And it was decided that Freeze would go get knives or something to help dispose of the body. So he went to Macy's and bought three large knives. Two of them were chef knives, one of them was a cleaver, and when he got back, Michael told him that if he gave him 10 bags of heroin, he would take care of this part. So Freeze did that, he gave him the heroin, and Michael went into the bathroom alone and cut off both of Angel's legs. They put each leg into plastic bags and then a duffel bag and separately carried them one at a time to the river and threw them in. And probably the next day, Freeze went downstairs to the storage area in their apartment and they got a box. They cut off the barcode and brought it up to the apartment. Michael put the remainder of Angel's body into a large plastic garbage bag and Freeze got another bag to put over the first one. Freeze said that he thinks before Michael put it into the first bag, he wrapped it in a sheet and after the second bag, Freeze taped it closed. And then they put the whole entire bundle into the box He said the smell was so unbearable that he put some baking soda to hopefully absorb some of the odor. And he also stuck a broom handle in the box for support because the weight was making the box collapse. A few hours later, they took the box into the elevator and out through the main lobby into a yellow cab that happened to be right outside the door. And the driver helped tie the trunk down and then they took the body to the West Side Highway around 25th Street. The taxi drove off and then they threw the box into the river. On December 5th, 1996, the police arrested Michael at 3 a.m. at the motel that he was living at in New Jersey. They took Michael out and questioned him and put him under arrest. Michael's former roommate, Freeze, was 
also arrested on the same day. And within hours, Freeze confessed, and Lauren just read you his confession. We're going to link his statement in the episode notes. Michael insisted that it was self-defense and that they disposed of the body in a panic. Later, he would say in interviews that they were just so messed up on drugs and that heroin can make you capable of anything, including cutting up a dead body. It's just disgusting. So Michael and Freeze ended up pleading guilty. There was no trial. They pled guilty to first-degree manslaughter, and they were sentenced to 10 to 20 years. I think that the reason why the police or the prosecutors offered them this plea to manslaughter was because they wanted them to testify against Peter Gation, but they never ended up testifying. Michael pled guilty to collaborating in the murder of his drug dealer, Andre Angel Melendez, and served 17 years in prison. He has done a lot of interviews upon his release. He had a YouTube channel. In interviews, he's very charming and very straightforward. He accepts responsibility for what he did. He admits that he killed Angel. He says that being on drugs is not an excuse because he was sober when he decided to take the drugs, but he does think that the drugs made him capable of doing horrible things that he would not have done if he were not on drugs. But he says it in a way that makes me feel that he knows what he should be saying, but I don't know if I believe that he believes it. I think one of the big problems, like we said in the beginning, is that this story is so romanticized and people have made this story into entertainment. Because it's so shocking. It has like all the great elements of a great story, but it's a horrible, awful tragedy. Even worse than the murder itself is what they did to the body after. Like, it's just disgusting. James St. James, he did a memoir called Disco Bloodbath, A Fabulous But True Tale of Murder in Clubland. This was reprinted with the title Party Monster after the release of the 2003 movie. I don't really think that the movie showed the intenseness of the story, and they made it all about Michael. I mean, all of these films and books and documentaries, they're all about Michael, and there's hardly anything out there about Angel. There was also a shockumentary made called Party Monster the Shockumentary, and that is based on the events leading up to and surrounding the murder. I think that you really should watch this if you haven't seen it because it does give you a lot of insight on what was going on during that time and the New York City nightlife culture. And it does have a lot of real clips and real interviews, and it is more documentary style. It's not the Hollywood movie that's so like glammed up. This one's more real and I I would recommend it. It was it was interesting to watch. Michael did an interview with Inside Edition. We're going to link to that in the episode notes. You definitely need to watch that. He said that he was scared and it was horrific and that everything changed. He said the DA would ask questions and people would make up answers because they wanted to be involved in the paper. He said that the Party Monster Hollywood movie made a horrible situation even worse. It's already bad enough as it was, Michael said, why take such a horrible thing and make it even more horrible? Like it was horrible enough. The truth was horrible enough. It's, if you watch this Inside Edition interview, you'll understand what we mean by you want to hate him as a horrible monster, but you just can't. He's genuine. He is, but that also is another problem with this case. Is right. That people like, Since he is that kind of person, like, he's so outgoing and outrageous, like, people want to know more about him. Right. And people don't, I don't want to say people don't want to know more about Angel, but there just isn't enough out there about Angel. And it it makes this into Michael's story. One of the most interesting things that he said was when he talked about karma. Mm -hmm. And karma did end up getting him because just... December 25th, 2020, Michael died of a heroin overdose. So that wraps up this week's disgusting murderer, Michael Alleg. And we're very sorry that we couldn't have told you more about the unfortunate victim in this case, Andre Angel Melendez. The Andre Angel Melendez memorial page shared a photo Gregory Kennel had posted of himself and Angel. And Kennel wrote, Andre was sweet, confused, and a little bit vulnerable, thus the menacing appearance with his beautiful Statue of Liberty mohawk. We hope that you enjoyed this week's episode. Make sure that you're following us on Instagram at Murderlicious Podcast 
or send us an email to murderliciouspodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next week.